Brian, welcome to the Judgment Call podcast. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for coming. Thanks so much, Torsten. I appreciate the invite. Absolutely. Um, we talked a little bit earlier, and uh, I learned a little bit when I did my research about Loop. And what it reminded me of is, is something that I've seen, I think, the first time about 15 years ago. And I don't know if you were behind the same thing. It is a digital picture frame where you have the ability for your friends and relatives to not just, and that's what I remember, there was an SD card that you um, add into um, a digital picture frame, but now you built something else that you can update over Wi-Fi, that you can update over the internet. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little more about the genesis of your idea. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, so yeah, no, totally. Um, so the genesis of the idea, it was really quite simple. I, I had my son, Alex, here. I live in San Francisco, but I'm originally from the East Coast and from Boston. And my family's kind of scattered about. And when I had him, I really then, I'm just a guy, right? You know, I'm not like sharing pictures too much with my family. And, but once that happens at life event, you then get much more concerned about that, like keeping people up to date and, you know, sharing their lives growing up. And, um, and I just didn't really want to put pictures of my kids on Facebook. It was as simple as that. That was kind of like the old, the only alternative at the time that I felt like Instagram or Facebook. And, and so I just sort of took a step back. Um, I, I, you know, did everything people do. I kind of created fake accounts sometimes and, you know, subgroups. It was just all quite complex. Um, and, you know, I was actually at the Stanford Design School um, at the time, too. And my sort of antenna was going up um, at the time about, like, you know, watching for friction in different areas. And, you know, I was doing it for other people and other businesses. And then I started to kind of observe this. So, you know, I actually started making an app. And I was like, this will be so straightforward. I'll make a cool little app. It'll be a little, little private thing, almost like path back in the day, but very family focused. And we really got nowhere with it. Right? Like it, we found it was really hard to get someone to sort of sign up for yet a new app that would do very similar things potentially on this on the sort of bigger platforms. Um, and, you know, it was a sort of side project. Um, and, you know, one day my dad got sick and he was on the East Coast. And I was like, oh boy, you know, this is, this is really, it was getting pretty serious. And I've got this little one-year-old boy here and, and he was beautiful. I'm like, maybe if I just get pictures to him of, you know, and videos of, of my son, Alex, it'll really lift his spirits and he'll sort of come out of this. Um, and so I sent him an iPad and, you know, spent hundreds of dollars on it, kind of loaded it up with different software and he never used it. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. You know, so I'm an engineer, got a little background here. Um, we built a, basically a screen that I could connect up to Wi-Fi. It had wires coming out of it, and it was connected to Raspberry Pi. Um, and I took that crappy app that I had and started connecting it. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, these pictures started to flow sort of effortly, efficiently, simply. And people started to ask me, by the way, are we good to go on this still? But, but people started to ask me, uh, <clears throat> people started to ask me if they could buy one, right? And I'm like, what are you talking about? It has wires. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's like a danger. Like literally, it's probably an electrical danger. And, and so I said, you know, come on, this is ridiculous. Kept happening. Went to my developer, um, who's like 26. And he's like, well, um, you know, I'm like, can I get that thing back? I just want to check it out in my own house, um, you know, and do it. He never gave it to me. Weeks go by and I go, hey, what's going on? He said, well, look, I, I'm having parties. And I've given out the app to a bunch of people. And now all of a sudden we have all these sort of channels running with all the people in the content and everyone kind of gets around the loop. And, and I was like, really? And so all of a sudden there was this sort of like there, I went from like an app that I thought was going to be sensational to nobody cared to, oh my God, everyone I talk with has a different sort of experience with this that makes it right for them. Um, and so that was really the sort of genesis of this. And, and by the way, bridging back to your idea about digital frames, I said, whoa, this is a really interesting way of getting, you know, all types of businesses were getting changed through connectivity and kind of changing. A friggin' thermostat becomes a $3 billion business for Google Nest, you know, because they added in some design and some intelligence behind it, you know, some better software. Um, drop cam, you know, those old security cameras, um, you know, billion dollar, you know, these were basically billion dollar companies um, that are bas basically just applying great software to some very, very simple, almost off the shelf hardware, you know, depending on how far you want to go. So, and, and by the way, just a little background, I was making, uh, while I was doing this, you know, project of Loop, 
I was actually, the core job, my day job was building video compression technology. And it's basically a chip and software. And if you opened up a drop cam slash nest cam or GoPro or ring doorbell, it's all the same thing. It's a little chip that in, in software that records and compresses video and sends it to the cloud, right? So I got to meet all these people in day one of their businesses, Jamie Simonoff from Ring Doorbell, when he just got going, he had sold a ton of stuff. And I had built a little reference design for a, a, a doorbell type camera. It's, I mean, it saved him days maybe, but you know, you know. but I think it was, we, we were in, in aligned in the thinking of the market. Um, I got to meet all those people, the founders of Dropcam. So I had a little bit in my head, this like, you know, kind of, I was kind of waiting for this idea because these guys are building these incredible businesses, incredible brands, basically built off some commodity hardware but with some amazing software um, and, and it was working. And I said, oh my gosh, you know, the digital frame, remember we talked about those things and they kind of didn't have, you know, it didn't really work. It, it just didn't work the way people thought it would. Um, and maybe it's time. And maybe we could use that as the sort of anchor point as being a simpler entry into people's lives, right? You know, hey, you know, you've heard of digital frame. Like, what if it did this and this? You know, maybe someone gives it a try and it worked. You know, it, uh, you know we were able to kind of Get on people's map radar. Yeah, like how you frame this, that we have this this somewhat unintelligent uh, digital hardware, and we just make it useful with all the software addition and the, the the design and the functionality in mind. When you when you go around Silicon Valley, and uh, I experience this when I talk to VCs, and you pitch a hardware startup, you usually get a lot of empty stares. There is some VCs who love you because they, they've been very successful with hardware, but generally they say, well, this is not for us. How did fundraising work for you? Because most accelerators that I know, they don't even accept hardware startups. Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't know what it was about us um, that kind of worked um, because we, in a sense, I mean, I still find fundraising to be incredibly hard, incredibly challenging, um, no matter what, even though we've raised some good money and we've made some progress, but no, answering your question, one, for sure, this is a piece of software, right? Um, let me give you a couple examples. I guess the other advantage, you know, Ring, making tons of money, right? Um, you know, successful, probably profitable to drop cam, same sort of thing. There were some examples when, you know, as they were exiting them, when we were getting started. Um, so, so maybe those were some proof points, but I actually think more so, to be honest with you, and this actually helped me, this is kind of a funny one, I used to have a little bit more of a story that was like IOT meets AI, right? You could imagine trying to use these buzzwords, right? And, yeah. you know, some people might squint and be like, okay, it's broadly directionally correct. I'm going to, and, but reality was it, it wasn't authentic. It really just wasn't an authentic story. So I started talking about like, you know, uh, like a character like me or somebody else. And I was like, well, you know, actually the first slide in my deck is like this guy, Alex, he just had a son, um, Jake, he lives in Seattle and his parents are spread out across and sisters across the country. And gosh, it's such a mess. They've got a little bit of email. They've got a text message chain, they, but his dad's on Android. He's on iOS. Right. And I just, I basically told the truth, our, our customer's truth. It's my first slide in my deck. And then everything started getting easy because people would just say, that's me. That's me. Like we were really solving a problem. It wasn't just some bogus bullshit, right? Like we, we built it because we were solving a problem. It turns out that a lot of people have the same exact problem. So yeah. once we kind of, I would argue, we got away with a little bit of the sort of momentum at the beginning, but very quickly I learned that the key is to tell your authentic real story and then to find the people that love what you're doing. Hardware, software, I don't, you know what I mean? Like whatever, like, you know, it's, there's customers, there's, you know, um, you know, problem solution, you know, there's, there's just a lot more broad to it, but you're, you're right though. I mean, you do have to be careful not to kind of lean into the hardware too much or, or even give off that you're kind of on this hardware journey versus no, no, I'm, I just want to reassure you my software roadmap, you know, here's how much I spent on software, as much as hardware, you know, and even yeah. as we, you know, kind of talked about before the podcast, the thesis was, Hey, look, man, those guys in China are, you like taking the cost out of this stuff and building high quality stuff. And I want to take advantage of that inefficiency or whatever you'd call it. Um, because all I have to do is dump my software and I tell them what to do. It's not that simple. 
Uh, but you know what? You know, our second product, our second generation, when we kind of learned the ropes a bit better, it really was that simple. I can tell you, we can talk about that later, but like it literally was. Once you figure it out, it could be really powerful and, and quite simple to get stuff done in China. Yeah, I think something has changed. And when I look back, um, there were a bunch of people who did DVRs. Um, I know a lot of people might not remember what that was, but it's something where you recorded digitally um, a TV channel, a TV signal. And that was a big deal about 20 years, 15 years ago. And it was, if you, if you made this hardware, you could do it all over the planet, but most people would eventually be drawn to China. And say the difference in manufacturing this device was it was 20% cheaper in China, still enough to make the comparable product and be the, you know, the most competitive in the marketplace, but it wasn't a 10x. What I feel like what we are getting to right now is similar to what we've seen with software. You only do it once, you develop it once, you code it once, but then you can run it unlimited number of times because the CPUs are so cheap and computing is getting cheaper by the minute. And it seems like we are now seeing something similar that's happening in mostly China, uh, but everywhere around the world, in factories that you, you always get a 10x. And I think we, we, we are used to in, and we see this especially in electronics now, and maybe this also plays a role what Apple is doing, because suddenly I feel like Apple, they didn't have a lot of core innovation for the longest time. So it was all, always slightly better than iPhones, but it wasn't never really a quantum jump. And now suddenly you see the M1 coming out, which is like 10 times faster than the Intel CPUs for probably the same price or much less. We see this with um, the new iPhones that seem to be very popular, at least in, in terms of buyers. It seems that it's something afoot, and I don't know if you can confirm this, but we, we see the software eating the world is now also software is eating hardware or hardware is, is behaving more like software as, as something that y you have, if you can figure out where the demand could be, it's almost free to make it, which is quite perplexing. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you, this. this is a perfect time for this conversation. Now, I mean, there's obviously a nuance to that. Um, you know, we, we made our first generation, we'll just call it loop one, um, which was a sort of retro looking device. It had knob, it, ha it has knobs on it. So it's kind of like got cool curves. Uh, you know, we could post up some pictures of it later. Um, and then we recently put a loop, made a loop two, which we just launched. That's what you'd see on my website today. You won't see a reference to my loop one because I just want to, you know, focus on that loop two for now. Um, that <laughs> the loop one almost was it that bad? Killed loop us, one? Right? Yeah. Well, the, it, it, it's an unbelievable it product. And, oh, it, oh, it, it's so good. I mean, it's the most unbelievable. Literally, uh, you know, the top designer at Apple, one of the top designer at Apple, like, has <laughs> like five of them in his family. Like, you know, it's Scott Belsky, one of my customers. I, didn't, I hope he's okay me talking about it, but he probably has five or six, you know, distributed. He told me he hasn't turned his off in a year, right? You know, it's in his kitchen. You know, I mean, it was, and my point of that is we kind of went over the top a bit. We kind of, were inspired by Apple and the sort of character and all the little, every little detail. And, and the reality was that the sort of reason why I'm going to bring up the story is I didn't have to deliver that much in order to solve my customers' problems, right? Like, because because a lot of it was in the software domain, right? The sort of, the issues were a lot in the software, the things that solved the problem, like, you know, how far did I have to go innovate on the hardware, let's say, in order to, one, get the customer to buy it, and number two, to kind of delight them on a daily basis. So I kind of feel like we overshot, and that's where we ran into trouble, um, where I was trying to ask people in China to do something that they hadn't done before, this, you know, in this specific way, right? You know, and remember, there might have been somebody that did it before, but I didn't talk to that right person, <laughs> like sometimes, right? That there's some inefficiency there. Where do you and that's, go? Like, Just, again, uh, to, sorry, well, where do you go? Well, say you you want that design, or you want a competitive design, you want a couple of bits. Do you go to Alibaba, or where do you actually go? How does this get started? Yeah, good question. Um, I mean, you could. Th there's multiple ways of doing it and now that I know. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you what I did before, right? I, yeah. I, you know, new people. I'd been traveling to China myself for a while too, um, and that was that is and was an inefficiency and more so in the past, you know, five years ago or so, whereas, yeah, you're right. Like, who do you talk to, man? Right. So we actually partnered with a, a company called PCH at the beginning. Um, and, and that was short lived, but it kind of gave me a sort of insight into, you know, how to get these folks. Um, and, you, you know, we, we, I was really kind of networking, to be honest with you, like, who do you know? Like, you know, who's a great person that does this? And, you know, we all did it kind of poorly. Um, I would argue, right. We, we, 
we got it done, but you know, it was way harder than it needed to be. He chose the right person, maybe made some design trade-offs that were a little bit less, you know, extravagant. You could have just kind of push out the product faster and cheaper. But you know, these days, um, you know, that people are starting to solve that. They're creating sort of marketplaces for um, the different manufacturers. I would not look, I wouldn't, you know, if, if somebody were doing a product today, I would say, hey, look, go into Alibaba and find the person that's doing what, you know, from a hardware point of view that you're doing the closest. And, and it just, so it's not a variation of what they're doing and, and see if you could start there start with those conversations, right? And, and and then the second piece is try not to veer too much, right? You know, assuming you're doing the same thing we're doing, you, you're going to be innovating in the hardware space. Let them do it. You know, you put your design stamp on it, takes you three months to come up with a sensational design, make sure it's manufacturable. Like you just, you, you don't have to be a genius to kind of figure this stuff out. Um, but, you, you know, get get into their zone and kind of meet them in the middle um, yeah. and then let them run. And, and I'll just give you this sort of example. Like our first product, took us probably 18 months traveling to China, a team in China, all this stuff. I actually had the drop cam team operations working for me. Like um, it was kind of incredible and we got it out, but it was like, woof, that was incredible hard. 2020 in March, I was trying to make our loop two, which is sort of be our millennial edition. You know, millennials are having kids and you know, that was what I would argue we kind of missed with the loop one was, you know, Oh wow. You know, these famous people use your product, right? How, you know, how exciting. And then you'd go to like maybe an average person and they'd be like, looks a bit kind of high tech. And, you know, I don't know if I want this in my home, you know, particularly women. Wait, and I said, oh, shoot. Having kids? Or did you just say that? When did that happen? Yeah. Did, did that something? <laughs> it, it, it all happened so fast. Last right? month? Yeah. Right. It must be, must be the last six months. <laughs> no, you know what I mean, though? I mean, obviously, it was a broad demographic, you know, but like, you know, we, it, it, it was something. It was like, oh, wow, these, you know, 30 ish people having kids, women. And we just realized we just didn't do a good enough job figuring out what they wanted, listening more. And, and anyways, that's what led us to this loop too. Number one, we were like, Hey, look, we, we never really took advantage of the cost as, as, as much as we thought about, you know, like, you know, if we do it again, we could find this really nail that cost structure that kind of, again, you, you go into their zone, right. You kind of stay on what they're doing. You don't try to do any magic. Um, they being China, um, you're trying to partner. Um, but, but also just this, um, you know, the concept of the design being, uh, friendly to, and, and fitting what, what the millennials or, you know, these moms might want to use. And so I just kind of, the example was I was pitching an investor like March 15th, this is like the last time I was in New York city. And I laugh about this cause you know, I'm in New York city. We're in a cafe March 15th of last year, right. 2020 of 2020, right. And, and we're all washing our hands, but we're like three feet away from each other, right? We're like, don't touch my hands, sorry, fist bump, but like breathing all over each other. Um, and I've got my laptop and I'm in the cafe pitching one investor. And I turn to the women next to me and I say, hey, which one do you want? We've got six of these. I kind of explain what we're doing. Um, and they're like, D, D, I like the, you know, the, what is the fourth one? And, and it was clear. I kind of like slapped my book down. I, I told the investor, I go, yeah, it, D, everyone loves D, right? Like uh, we're going to make that. Fast forward, I, now I can't travel to China. Fast forward from March 15th, December 15th, I shipped about 500 of those units to the market. Yeah. I never went to China. I didn't have anyone working with me like to help me. It was just me, my team, and the guys that are building it. Um, and the, the guys and girls, there was that, you know, it was actually quite a dynamic team down there, which is great, uh, men and women. Um, but they, uh, they crushed it. And it was because I chose the right partner and it cost me, I mean, literally, maybe like $25,000 out of pocket. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. like people are like, oh, hardware costs so much. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like my software bill in a month is, you know, bigger than these. So yeah, it seems like there's something big un underway. When you look at the hardware costs, so are the, the, is the retail price for, for Loop is still at 250? So that's still the case? N no, 179. Loopfamily.com okay. is, yeah. 179 is the sort of sticker price of our Loop and obviously, um, so yeah, as most, we have sales all the time. Yeah, hopefully you can be very honest with us. What is the obviously depends. Say so you make a hundred thousand devices or a million devices. I don't know if you did the, the calculations. What is the hardware cost of this once you make a million devices? Yeah, gr great question. In fact, um, this is this is another piece of the of the puzzle we learned when we were making Loop Two. I, I told you the requirements, right? It was like number one, I wanted to um, to be. Uh, uh, 
fitting for new millennials or having kids, right? Particularly millennial moms, and that sort of thing, women in general. That's number one, right? The design kind of has to fit them, the features, like integrations, how it works. That's number one. Number two uh, was this. Um, we had just figured out a subscription model, right? So we are able to command, which is great, kind of like ring doorbell, three bucks a month from our customers for an array of cloud services. You know, there's backup, there's a handful of other things, but you know, basically it's like a backup in the cloud plus some other cloud-based services. Um, and so you're giving, a, so you're giving away the devices. You, you're like Amazon. Well, Apple. that's where I'm so going. You're leading so, to. So that, yeah, that's what I'm leading to, right? Yeah. So, so, so I, so I basically found it. So that it's three bucks a month, thirty-six a year, right? Roughly, yeah. right? And I said, hey guys, so here is the other thing we need to make. The loop needs to cost thirty-six bucks to make, right? And I said, so if we get our subscription to equal the, then we could potentially give it away for free, you know. At the limits, if you wanted to, oh, wait, and, what, what, and start. Yeah, but wait, you get you selling it for one seventy nine. Are you planning to literally give it away, like the Amazon Fire? Well, well, th these things are things you don't want to jump right into, right? You yeah. want to actually iterate and test because remember, there's a price sensitivity um, that goes along with this. Maybe free, maybe you get the same uh, demand at ninety nine dollars than you get for zero, right? Yeah. Because not everyone needs it, right? You know, it's not like yeah. you know. Well, so, I, so I always, it, obviously, with software products, it's often and in a more specialized software product, it's as complicated and as expensive to get a free subscriber, so to speak, if it's a real subscriber, right, than to get a paying one. If the if it's thirty six dollars a year, I think it's almost the same thing for most things that I know of. Right, right, and so, but but again, it's really just kind of math and testing, right? Like, so yeah. <clears throat> you, you might be able to say, as an example, so there's a bunch of variations on this, right? Um, one might be you give a steep discount at the beginning, so 179, then you drop it to 99, huge savings if you sign up for my $3 per month, right? Yeah. Does that shift your revenue dramatically from hardware to software? Does that give you a higher take up rate experiment? That's just an experiment, right? Sure. <clears throat> then you could potentially drop it further and further um, and see where that line drop, you know, and I got this from Dropcam too, because they had, remember, they had $7 a month, $30 a month, um, and, you know, I, I believe we can go up the ladder, too. We did, we're just trying to get creative and, and, and learn a bit more. It's not exact science right now. Why $3 a month? But um, but ultimately, I saw them and, and I asked the founders. I'm like, so why didn't you give it away for free? You were making such subscription. And then explode. And he goes, <clears throat> you know, um, we don't really have a great reason. You know, we were actually really thinking of doing it. And, uh, you know, I hope I'm not speaking for Amir too much, but he said he would felt that he was a bit of the conservative voice in the world and the VC wanted to do it, Greg wanted to do it, <clears throat> but that he was kind of like, hey guys, we got a great thing going here. Like, why are we gonna screw with this? We're growing fast, we're profitable, or is, is pro I don't know how profitable they were, but certainly their economics worked and all that. Um, and so, you know, it's like, why screw this up? And he's like, looking back, maybe it was the right call, but then they got bought by Nest and it all didn't matter, right? So, um, but, but, so- But Brian, yeah. help me again, when you, when you think of big numbers, what can be the price of such a device that you're making? And like, obviously it depends on a bunch of factors, <clears> but <throat> can you make it say for $20? Is that realistic at all? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I would say a variation of what we make, maybe making it a little smaller or something like that. I think, you know, at the margins, maybe 25 or something like that, you know, maybe, maybe as low as 20, you know, you, you are impacted by the display cost, which is the biggest piece. Um, yeah. But like you still have to have there's a limit in terms of like, oh, you know, there has to be the connectivity chips, you know, there has to be all these things that don't go away. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, you know, it's getting really, really, really cheap. That's so, so cheap. That uh, is so cheap. And I assume it's a 720 uh, <clears throat> display. That's the resolution. Yeah, it, it would be something like that. And, and again, like our displays, people are like, that's amazing. Look how incredible that like life like. Yeah, it's like three-year-old ipad technology right and yeah. you know or, or longer so it's been depreciated you know everything's gone but from a five foot we're a five foot experience versus like a you know a three inch experience so you know the pixel resolution does not have to be anywhere it's not even on the map no one's going to be able to see the resolution on something like that so yeah. um yeah no it's, it's getting there that, that is quite incredible i mean I, I can see a ton of different businesses that have a similar problem where we we didn't realize how cheap the technology has gotten due to Moore's law and all the the, the investment going in from, from the iPhone side and what Samsung puts in. And then 
we on the other side realize that a lot of this technology is too hard for users to set up, like you know, Dropcam and um, what Loop is doing, where you could do this with another device. You could buy an old iPad off eBay, right? And could do it and set it up for your parents, but it would take forever. So if nobody would right. do it. Yeah. And I think there's That's a lot exactly of those right. use cases where, where a lot of people are just, yeah. I mean, you have these TVs now, you know, TVs have all these apps and they have so much connectivity, but getting it to work is, is, is just menacing. And you just want to press one, one button and then it should work. Like the old TV, and that's the challenge, right? Because you have to download these apps yeah. and you have to get the latest update and then you can't sign in and then it's this long password. Yeah. There, you spend like half an hour to sign into Netflix. You know, that, that is, that was, I would argue that that was part of the thesis of our business as well, or maybe more of like a cultural, you know, North Star of saying, I just want anybody to just turn this, you know, you open up the box. I mean, even our the way our instructions are in the box, it's kind of like, plug in and enjoy <laughs> like you know it's kind of but the point is actually you plug it in it turns on the screen tells you what to do right you know and you just kind of walk through these steps it, it, we're not perfect yet but we pay so much attention to you know how do i get this so that you know 99 percent of people of any tech stack like ability it will be obvious to them what they're doing and how it's working. Um, and, and that's really hard. Making something simple and easy to use is really hard to do. Uh, yeah. but it's, but it's, but it, but as you said, you know, even that idea, remember I kind of mentioned in the beginning, it's like, there's all types of friction that people aren't aware of. Like, Hey, I got this amazing new app. It's so cool. Uh, you just have to get everyone in your family to download it. Ready? It's free. It's free. It's totally free. Okay, great. Instantly. Everyone's like, Ew. like, you know, that sounds like work. Like how many phone calls am I going to have to do? And then, you know, like who, you know, who's going to manage this stuff? Like, so there's friction everywhere. Uh, and that's our, a bit of our intent is, you know, how do we pull these things away? How do we kind of subtract from these, uh, these friction points and shave it and shave it and shave it. So it's just so yeah. simple to use. Yeah. I mean, Apple has definitely shown us the way there. Um, because we've seen Linux phones before the iPhone. They, they've been out for a couple of years. They've worked kind of on, on a similar software stack. They looked the same. They had a stylus or maybe not. But nobody really bought into them. And it wasn't a mass phenomenon. And then suddenly the iPhone took off because they got this point right. I wonder if we're going to keep seeing uh, these two paths. Because on one hand, we have we have labor costs, which seems to rise slowly somehow with, with innovation or with, with inflation. It doesn't really seem to be impacted much by innovation. Maybe it's going slower than it used to be. That argument can be made. But the hardware cost it seems to continuously improve with Murphy's Law. With, not Murphy's Law. Murphy's, with Law. <laughs> Murphy's Law. You actually get both when you Because it never works, right? <laughs> yeah, but, totally. <laughs> what, <laughs> That's a great one. What I wanted to get to is, um, we, but we also always want to... We want more out of our devices, right? We get this iPhone and like six months later, it's boring. We want the next iPhone because it could do more, but we don't really know why we want this new iPhone, right? Is it, we don't have a specific use case in mind or usually it's just, we, we wait for something to inspire us. What I'm trying to say is, what do you think we're going to see, and we see this with AI, that we we have this, this, this whole software and hardware stack will get so cheap and continue to be so cheap that it, at some point, it will be very hard for labor to compete with this. Well, what I'm trying to say is we, there will be very, very few tasks left that humans are really useful, like worth investing that much money in humans because AI and computers can already solve this. And uh, what, what, you're, what you guys are after is you kind of, you have to remarry technology with humans, right? This is kind of the software stack you, you're talking about. hundred percent, yeah. But for lots of back-end, like if you think about back-end tasks and software development where you basically, you're just interfacing different machines, computers are not are talking to each other, humans are not involved. Do you think we're going to run into a problem that we will realize, well, what am I supposed to do with these humans? I mean, or, or what tasks should I give them that they are competitive at? Uh, so there seems to be millions of jobs we're, we're completely eliminating over the next 20 years. You know, I, I would, my counter to that would be that I, I can't imagine, um, I can't imagine there being less demand for software somewhere in the, in the stack um, in 20 years, you know? And, and, and so, 
you know, I had actually been thinking about, you know, this other business you were thinking about is like, you know, what's the new factory, right? And the new factory could be a building full of, and this kind of happening in some fashions, but it's like, you know, what's going on in Pittsburgh, you know, the old steel town, right? Oh, it's a building with software. And they have a bunch of people that do quality assurance. That's probably the most people in the entire company. It's kind of an entry level job, but you got to check if things are working, right? And then you go up the ladder, you know, then there's a manager that has to manage each level. And so you get a hierarchy and you get all these varying skill sets, you know, from the highest level architecture down to, and, and so I, I just don't think that, and I don't think it happens in the past where this sort of just goes away and you magically push a button. Um, and everything just sort of works. Nothing ever works like that. Um, and so I think as we go up the complexity level, which is where we're going, sort of up in the complexity, it just yeah. filters down with all these really hard, hard things to do. And I would even argue now, it's like, oh, great, look at all these software tools that we have. It's so amazing compared to 20 years ago. It's probably more complex to make software now than it was 20 years ago takes more people. I've got the integrations and the APIs, but the APIs didn't work and the software stack and my Amazon service, which is- It really push depends. Button. It really depends. I always make that example. You can literally just download a bunch of repositories of GitHub. Most of them work, but if they're well-maintained and then add a few lines of code and you're good to go, you can have AI running for you, whatever you want to do. So this is- Stitch amazing, those right? together, stitch those two things together and a complexity happens at the interface. That is going to require an engineer three months to be, if they're good, to figure out where the bug is and what happened. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and all the permutations. Now, in now, all of a sudden, a twenty customers hit that from ten different directions and different use cases at the same time. Amazon servers and the Wi-Fi went down, but we had twenty users come in and they were uploading and downloading at the same time. Oh shoot! Okay, more complexity. Okay, now as you talked about, hey, the the product's getting better. This is amazing. We're adding another feature. Okay. The new feature causes an interface to the old feature that breaks it and like so and how do you solve that but, i mean maybe ai will be able to solve some real basic ones but um so i just think the complexity is what creates opportunity um and so if we're if we're getting more and more if we're getting simpler meaning that the demands of it go down the software demand for the functionality goes down that's a problem if it's going up i think it's just more is more I like how you say that complexity creates opportunity. You, you have, I think you're onto something there. I love it. But there's going to be a lot of jobs that we have now that are just not complex enough, right? They're, they're just too repetitive and they will all go out the window. One thing that seems to be, <clears throat> I don't know if you ever thought about that, that seems to be very resistant to this is the construction industry. You know, that's as much making your hands dirty as we can think of in many modern industries. And I always think if we would get to a level where we can see similar economics that we now see in hardware and definitely we see it in software, anything that's been around in the last 30 years and somewhat popular, if we could get similar economics into the construction industry by literally, it doesn't have to be an intelligent robot, it can be a drone, it can be several different devices that live in the physical world. We don't have a lot of those yet, but I think we're getting more. Then we would we would bring the economics, and I think healthcare and construction is kind of the only things left with the huge inflation because we just can't add, bring them in from China or build them in a, in a little. Yeah, they're not um, fungible. Right? Yeah, yeah, they are not done in a in in a Silicon Valley for free, and we be use them for free like most of the software services now. If we could ex if we could export the same um, elements of the economics to these industries, healthcare and construction. I think we all live in this utopia world that a lot of people now bring in. And I think this is a millennial thing. I think about that a lot is you want kind of everything for free and you reminded me with your device and uh, you want healthcare for free and you want rent for free and you want everything in your life for free. And you basically just sit there and say, okay, today I feel like I should do a little work. That's kind of the idea. That's the dream of the millennial, so to speak. And I must say there's something nice to it, right? There is this ring to it, this, this complete optionality that is this, this this creativity that's that's the only thing that matters and most industries it's already like that when you think of food delivery right it's just like if you sit in your sofa press a couple of buttons and the best food in town arrives 10 minutes later and uh, we, we we did this with with, with, inter with the internet we did this with software there's just a few industries left and then the socialist utopia is there as strange as this sounds <laughs> yeah i think um you know i i, I I, I guess um, a lot to unpack there, right? Um, 
it, but I, I think maybe it does come back to this sort of complexity thing. I mean, I mean, there's two pieces of it, right? There's, there's kind of like, hey, look, you know, the things I'm interested in talking about. One is, what if we became so sort of wealthy and it was spread out that you didn't have to work? What happens to people? Um, and, you know, the way I think about that is that, you know, I think it's very important for people to have purpose and to, um, you know, wh wh whatever that would be, that you feel like you're being valuable, right? People kind of pat you on the back and say, great job, right? And you worked hard at something. We, I think everyone's felt that reward cycle. But that's not know, a good argument, and, I feel. I know this is, the, this is kind of the traditional argument, but I think there's a lot of purpose in, say, for, for, art, for, for something that's artistic, for, for poetry. For, oh, I agree. That, that's part of this. That make no but money. That's part of this. They make, they'll never make any money. Right, right. But, but I'm not talking about making money. Um, so I, okay. I, you know, I'm just ge generally talking about making sure that there's, you know, a sense of purpose that people do stuff um, and whether or not that involves the salary or, you know, and you, you can talk about the fact, you know, this wealth distribution or how it works. Um, but, but also, you know, on the flip side, I don't really go down that angle too much because um, it just still feels like to me, there's always the, maybe the complexity factor again. Like it just, um, I think you could drive costs out of, you know, America is quite a rich country, and but a lot of people don't feel rich. Um, so there's, you know, maybe some issues there. But, you know, when I think about, I, I kind of agree that like, you got these two overhangs, this healthcare thing, that if we can figure that out, you look at that, you know, it's, it's like a line item at my business. I'm like, how the hell can we get that bill down, right? It's possible, yeah. probably, right? And then what does that free up? And then where does that go to? Right. If it frees up and then just goes to the one percent, you know, not like a one percent or kind of thing. Well, but we just know economically if that did happen, that wouldn't be helpful. Um, so there's a couple things to unpack there. But but, but also but, I, I just think in terms of uh, jobs and like thing yeah. problems to solve, I guess is probably what I'm actually more getting at. Let, let's say there's part of what we do it could be boiled down to problems to be solved. You solve a problem. That's a business. That's a kind of the definition of a business. Right. Is you solve somebody's problem at its core. Yeah, right. but a lot, and a lot so of, yeah. a lot of entrepreneurs and VCs have burned their fingers in those industries because just the, the, that core innovation, that push, this wave that comes behind you, just never happened. And I'd rather create more money for the one percent and reduce our healthcare bills by, by, with better quality yeah. um, by the factor yeah, of true. ten. That'd um, be better. Yeah, that'd be to better. make it. You know, the true. socialist argument doesn't work in that sense. It's we make everyone equal, which is somewhat true. Um, but it also, everyone ends up being really poor just five or 10 years from now. It always goes down this, this line. So I'd rather have a real dynamic industry, but obviously it's not, there's regulation. I think that's one big problem. But the other problem is, is it just hasn't happened. The technology isn't ripe for this yet. But when we, when we look at this, this drop in productivity growth, I think what happened is, and, and Eric was, was saying this, Eric Reno was saying this, if what's kind of happened is, and I'm, I'm curious how you think about that. I'm being in Silicon Valley for so long. I feel like we, we are not daring enough. We are not tackling the industries where we would see the, the impact of technology brings a huge impact in productivity growth. And what I mean by this is the biggest expenditures we have are, as you said, healthcare, um, cars. We can say Tesla helps a little, but it's even more expensive than all the other cars. Um, construction of housing, of shelter. Those are the big line items that we pay for every day. This is 90% of our budget. Nothing has really happened in these areas. And tra I would even include travel. Travel has, it's, not, it's a little better, but the efficiency gain from the airplane in the 1990s or the 1960s and 2020s, there's almost the same airplane, maybe 20% less fuel. I mean, who cares, right? We didn't see the 10X. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I used to, yeah. Go ahead. Mind if I jump? I, you know, I yeah. used to have the same argument too, which I, I was like, are you kidding me? Like I literally, you know, drive this fairly straightforward car that look, resembles the same one from 50 years ago, this combustion engine, right? This is like, five, let's call it five years ago. The planes are literally from like the sixties, you know? And I watch a TV that's basically the same thing, right? It's like these huge parts of our lives haven't really evolved, right? Like, oh, it's great, it's flatter. But okay, wonderful. This but is, so we don't see productivity growth, and that's Peter Thiel's team, but others have pointed it out much before, is because we don't push enough. We don't take this absolutely software is the, a huge technology, the world changing technology and the internet. We don't push it enough to go into these industries. We should just drop all these requirements, drop all the regulation, and as society come together, so to speak, 
um, go to Mars and just say healthcare can only be one yeah. percent of the GDP. If it's more, something is rotten. So let's get rid of all the regulation and say one state only or two states, and they can do whatever they want. Yeah, I, the way I look at it is this, um, and I think this thesis is starting to prove out. Let's flash back ten years. Ten years. Think of how you know, like we were such luddites ten years ago, right? And but the thesis that you might have argued was it looks really if you look at the exponential curve at the bottom, it looks really flat. Right. And then it just starts going fucking crazy. Right. And so what I've observed in the last 10 years, right, is and maybe some of it's due to the smartphone. It, this is kind of, you know, it's a communication device and all that. But it's like we have now going to a rapid deployment. We're, we're putting people you know, private companies are blasting people up and down, right? You know, press a button, communicate with anywhere in the world for free, you know, kind of Spock style Star Trek communicators that are getting incredibly powerful. And so we're now going up that Jetsons curve, right? Yeah. We're now just starting to hit these things and it's a compounding effect, right? It's just a, you know, someone had to build, someone had to build a bunch of batteries for this and bring that cost down, which then enabled a guy to build a car that wouldn't cost, you know, look, kind of expensive at 80 grand, but really they were like 250,000. It's not really even a business, right? So, you know, and then they're even doing their own scale thing. I'll make a, you know, Tesla's, I'm going to make a, you know, a, a, a sports car for very small audience that's really expensive. Then I'm going to make a high-end sedan, and then I'm going to make a medium-end sedan, and then I'm going to, and suddenly they're 30 grand. Right. Yeah, but I feel it's still hitting hitting the low hanging fruit. I mean, this is maybe what the VCs dictate us as entrepreneurs. They don't care about ambitions, right? They care about making money in five years or less. But there's something about the level of how we hit the low hanging fruit that really disturbs me. In terms of what we what what my grandfather talked about, he he talked about free energy. That was something he will, thought he will see in his lifetime. Um, he thought about supersonic flight is going to be everywhere there is no one world to go much slower and so there's so many things that we just gave up in the mid 70s and i wonder why nobody has really given me a good answer why we just gave up on it because i think it's a self-fulfilling prophecy if we would have there more I, we might be i'll there. be honest with you I, here's what i thought i think that the government is what invested these massive amounts of money that created the opportunity for that next level of innovation and most private investors don't have that type of budget to move the needle on something that big. Yeah. Um, and so that therein lies. Now, remember, you know, Kleiner Perkins did a lot of clean energy stuff 15 years or 20 years ago. I can't remember when it was. It was just a little early, right? It, it, maybe the input technologies just weren't there yet. And obviously China as a, as a country invested this huge amount of money to own solar panels. So they gave them away for free, drove down the cost, but they kind of, you know, bottomed out the market, which then destroyed US based innovation in that area, you know, what kind of investor is going to go back at that, you know, it's going to take another decade or two to get the gumption up to now reinvest in some of these technologies. But I agree. The other thing I'll agree with though is look at healthcare. Like, why haven't we been doing remote healthcare for, you know, until finally, the pandemic requires it, right? Yeah. You know, and and it's a way better experience, right? Um, I think it's a mind so, issue. So I think there is something going on since the 70s, especially, that is, yes, the government plays a role, but I mean, we are the government, at least in the US, right? So we, it, it, there is our democratic leaders, at least in theory, they just, they come, go in front of us and lead us, not by their own opinions, but what they sense where the populace will be, in theory, of this is always true, I don't know. But it's different than a dictatorship. So the government is basically just an expression of what we want, more or less. Um, I mean, it, it goes up and down in the cycle. And I don't know if there's a conviction, there's something that the World War, where we, World War II, where we had this conviction of an enemy. Right. And then we, but we had Russia in the 70s, so we did have an enemy, a real enemy. Dude, it was definitely weakened already in the 70s, and that's kind of my thesis. We don't have, we've lost these 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 impulses that were given to us certainly by religion and we lost these impulses of an enemy in real life and we somehow we just trundle along yeah. comfortably which is nice but it's a bit like you know the end stage of the roman empire there's less urgency there's less urgent yeah right right there's let there's potentially less urgency right there's less at stake you know when the guys were up at nasa 
working day after day after night and night and night and night to beat, you know, or kind of surpass Sputnik or something like that. Um, can't see your family for months and months and months. There's a lot of sacrifice involved in these incredible innovations in a short amount of time. Manhattan Project, like, it's incredible. Um, now, again, those were government um, funded. So, you know, you know, maybe that's a piece of the equation. Uh, but also when I look at healthcare now, I mean, that's really interesting, right? Because I, I, I think it was Bill Gurley talked about it where he's like, man, I tried getting into this, like, but there's just so much regulation. Like I can't even, even if I innovated, I didn't even know if it was going to, it is no telling whether it's going to get adopted or whatever, because it's all locked up. And so, you know, I think some of those things, even if they had some big pockets would get scared off because of some sort of regulation. Um, and it actually just went a little connection. It was kind of fascinating. I was actually um, uh, at a fundraiser for a Boston based uh, uh, congressman. And he was like, you know what? Government doesn't seem to do that great of a job. <clears throat> and I'm not an anti-government. Like I, I, I've benefited a lot, right. Uh, from, from all types of government stuff. Right. So I'm not really, but he actually kind of made me think about it too. And he said, you know, I shouldn't there be a lot of business people in government? It, are there like, what is it? You, you know, what's the makeup of these people? And so he did the math and he said, guess how many people in Congress have a background in business? That was 4%. Yeah. It was yeah. four. Yeah. It's rare. <laughs> and that was and like, they're they're oh, probably that's all from Texas and the audience. <laughs> probably. Yeah. Probably. Right. And, and so, and so now I was like, that makes sense. These are sort of people that became maybe lawyers and, and sort of, it's like a lawyer running my business. You know, I mean, you've got to be a really special dynamic lawyer to have all those tools, you know, but they're debaters and when, you know, it's kind of like fight. So it, it's, it's part of it is that I would even argue this is kind of crossing into some other territory, but like what I would love to see is that it became, I was just having this conversation with somebody else recently, which was, I feel like in the founding of this country was like people that were talented in other areas sort of came into the government as a level of service, right? Like, Hey, I'm a little bit older and wiser. I'm going to, you know, try to help out a bit and, you know, not all altruistic, but you know, there's always an ego involved in these things. But what if that was a, a, a typical cycle for us here, right? Oh, I just made some really serious, you know, things, but I just want to give back. And so now it's like half think... of, you know, half of people have like a business or organizational experience. I, I, I love that idea, but I don't think it's going to happen. And here's why, because I think the specialization has gone so far up. So basically what, what, what our representative democracy requires from the actors, so to speak, to be like actors, right? So, and that's what this whole debate totally. with Trump and Hollywood was about. They yep. were, they're the yep. same people, right? So obviously yeah. Trump is playing a role that was designed for him to get him elected and to actually potentially be reelected. And it's, it, when you're a senator, you will you better figure out how to be a good actor and you know speak in different language and you yeah. do it slightly different. But it's very similar. Yeah. And the CEO jobs are very similar too. But as an entrepreneur, you're the opposite. You're not an actor. You want to you want to tell people what they well, should do. So you will never get elected. Well, yes and no. I I would argue that well, number one, we found that I'm thinking of like a guy named Harry Reid, right? I think he led the thing. I I don't know him that well, but. I mean, I remember listening to him. I'm like, that guy's the leader, like of the I don't know, House of the Senate. God, he was not a very charismatic guy, right? He's on this com if committee, you, right? The the, the, uh, the that um, man. What is it? What do they do? They they do uh, appropriation committee, isn't that him? Yeah, I, I think he was higher than that. To be honest okay. with you, I mean, I think he I think leader of the House or something like that. Okay. But in any event. What we're finding now is we used to think that all the CEOs were Jack Welsh guys or maybe Steve Jobs guys shooting guns. And now you're looking back and you're going, you know, it's like books like good, good, good to great. It takes all types, shy people, reserved people. They're all successful, right? Um, in different ways, right? Is there's multiple ways of skinning the cat to be successful now. So I, I still think that there's possible to be successful multiple dimensions, um, on, uh, you know, on, on a different angle. Um, I do think though that we're in a cycle, of what's getting rewarded, right? And it actually reminded me in politics. It reminds me of when Howard Stern, are you familiar with Howard Stern? Yeah. Shock Jock Radio. He went on of course. and he created this outrageous thing and he started blow, you couldn't not listen to it, yeah. right? 
It was so outrageous. He started to knock people off every radio station. And so the other shock jocks started jumping in and they started trying to be even crazier. They were getting like fined and lost. And so there was just this shock jock wave, right? It's gone. It kind of, he's a calmer guy. Other people calm down and that's not rewarded anymore. Right. There was just different models. Like even like sports radio maybe became more important too. like, but like it was a period in time that's gone. And you might argue that you're right. Today's people get rewarded for that. But in a, in a new world in some time, 10 or whatever years from now, people will be rewarded for something different potentially. I hope. I hope so. But you know, you've got to accept, I think Eric Hoffer told me this, there is, there's a, the mass movement where you, where you you be the author authoritarian you're the leader you tell people what to do in the mass movement but a, a properly working democracy you've got to anticipate what people want in a few weeks from now or maybe in a week from now you saw this with COVID, right so we we basically all the, the uh, politicians on both sides kind of flip-flopped remember that they were like what do we do with masks and then the oh, uh, democratic oh, yeah. party was all oh. about oh it's like you can never wear masks as racist and you have to go to chinatown and then two weeks later, they were like, if you don't wear a mask, you're racist. And then everyone flipped on the, on the Republican side. And I think that we're going to see this again. Now, I think in California, especially, we saw this, this, this very strong COVID response. And now it flips to the other side where everyone will be. And that was my prediction six months from now. If you have a mask on in, in California, people think you're a racist because you didn't get the vaccine or whatever is wrong with you. Um, the opposite of what just happened 12 months ago. So there is... You, you've got to really triangulate. And I think Bill Clinton was the best at this. He was, he was a genius. He really figured out how to triangulate where people will be in a relatively short time frame from now and then get ahead of this movement, even if it requires you to just lay to rest all your convictions. And if you don't do this, I don't think it's, you will not sustainably be reelected. I mean, you maybe get lucky because you, you have, you're ahead of everyone for some lucky reason. But then the next election, it's over. And I think this is what happened to Trump to an extent. He didn't play his role good enough. Well, maybe he just was unpopular. But it's the, you take a big risk and it rarely happens. So you will never be in Senate for 20 years. It's never going to happen, which I, it seems like everyone wants to be. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. I agree with a lot of what you just said. And, you know, I mean, but I think those skills are always in, you know, certain skills are always in vogue, right? You know, to be, yeah. the ability to relate to people, to predict what to say what they want to hear to be honest with you um that's part of the this game right in a way right how do you that politics is about potentially saying what you i used to like john mccain a lot right and i, and I think what i loved about him was you know he was a straight talk express he would say this stuff and you were just like oh my god like the guy you know i agree with that so much right but that's really going to be unpopular with some other people um anyway yeah. so and i think in some ways that's what I think Trump took that, took that to yet another level, um, but could only be done through the power of incredible persuasion of personality, right? That, you know, yeah. and again, you can't replicate. It's like, it's like you can't be Reagan again, you know? And, and that has been a failure of people, right? Trying to kind of out Reagan, Reagan, and then they kind of fall flat a little bit because there's only one guy. Yeah, well, yeah, I think what, what is the new trend is very hard to predict, right? I always say we need a new thing to that people can obsess about on Twitter so they forget about COVID. And I think it's happening now, but it didn't happen for 12 months. And before that, it was obviously Trump. There's always this mega themes and there's smaller themes. Bitcoin is probably one thing people obsess about. There is these, there's relatively hard to forecast trends or, or themes that come up where people really obsess or very passionate about. And then weirdly enough, you ask them six months later, and they're like, look at the answer. Yeah, yeah, this is this is history. I'm like, well, no, but six sure. months ago, you would have like like gone to 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 extremes to defend your position, and now you don't. Yeah, they don't even want to talk about it. So I found this weird, especially because the same people who held these strong opinions, they they don't find that weird. They're like, okay, no, but that was six months ago, and I'm like, yes, but it nothing really changed, right? Everything. Well, you can you can make that argument that things have changed, but not in such a short time frame. And that, I think, is increasing because of the information overload. We lose track of what's actually happening. So do you think that that's a result of the new mechanisms of social media? It's right? Is that like an, is that a, an output? Or, or, so you think before, okay, right. So you're saying that it was like this before, but maybe longer periods or, yeah. you know, maybe yeah. not as high peaks or something More like moderated. that. And it will, will I mean, eventually yeah. it will peter off because 
we will see that people get adjusted to the information overload. That is probably already in the process, and we're pretty far in on this. But this is what created all this, the, the, the social media hypocrisy in the end, because you, you, you went on a cycle, as you said, where this, the social media itself was the theme, right? You wanted to go there and be really excited and hate a bunch of people and then go on with your life. <laughs> And now you look at them and you're like, oh, okay, they don't matter. So you know, you don't get excited anymore. So you jump to the next thing, and uh, that's probably human nature. And they, they probably exploited it the best. Um, but they needed a theme, and they need they, they need a new theme. I don't know what's going to happen next. Well, but but you know, I mean, but let's even think about it this way. We, you and I talked about this before the podcast, but like you know, um, the movie The Social Dilemma, right? And and understanding, you know, this is where this AI thing was probably the most practical use of it and and unfortunately really i think it has bad you know uh, outcomes but you know the fact that i used to think that facebook and all these social networks are showing things that you really liked right and there's a piece of that but the algorithm found something even more powerful in our brains right that triggered other things which was this sort of uh hate or or whatever or, or opposing views right and i told you that I don't really use Facebook that much, but it still sends me notifications. I, I use them as a business, so I get the notifications. It's always someone that would probably have an opposing view to me, like strongly. And, and, and I'm not talking like a little bit over here, a little bit over there. It's like that cousin or aunt that is just so far um, over there. Um, and that's what they show me. And because they know that will get me, they're watching how long I'll read it, I, you know, how long I stand, they've got all these cues. And I think that that is, you know, that that's not natural, right? That's not it. That's an unnatural thing or unnatural thing um, that's kind of amplifying things, which then creates more of this drama of, you know, I believe the rest of the world. I had a buddy from Boston I grew up with, and he's like, "Geez, man, how's it going in San Francisco? Like the fires and like the, you know, the people with the zombies on the street and like, you know, what about your kids?" I'm like, "I don't know. I'm at the park right now, man. What are you, what are you talking about? It's like yeah. heaven." You know, and, and he's like, but you know, it's like people, the protests. I'm like, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, well, it's and true, so, right? But he says, <laughs> but it's also not true, right? It's true in incidents, but it yeah, has yeah. nothing to do with the 24 seven life that's going on. And, uh, but, yeah, yeah. but, but what I wanted to say about social media is it goes into what gets people to interact, meaning, and what they track. It's they, they do see the, how long you look at something, but they're really mostly interested in, in likes, comments, shares, see on Facebook. But who does that? I mean, those are those are kids, right? Well, I would never click on something on Facebook and say like, why would I ever do this? And I use Facebook every day or comment on something. This is Classic. Yeah. So they really they 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 came from this, I don't know, eighteen to twenty five year old demographic and just blew it out of proportion because they don't have anything else well, to measure. It's a, it's a shortcoming of the tech. You know, but all the, the, the a lot of these things are built on the power law, right? Like, uh, remember I said, hey, I don't like to put pictures of kids on on Facebook. And when I started researching it, I realized not a lot of people do. Yeah. There's this 10% of people that go crazy doing it. And you're like, wow. And, and so they fill up the feed. Yeah. And and so we're all voyeurs and they're the doers. Um, yeah. And that is the leverage model that makes the engagement, you know, kind of work. Um, so, so it's about power users. Was the year of the sociopath? That's the power <laughs> user, right? So there's a sociopath. If, oh, yeah. Then you go to Facebook, you, you play your game, you play with people's emotions because you don't have any. And you know that that character strength has yeah. really been amplified um, in the last couple of years. And I, I don't know if that, yeah. what, what's next, what's the year 2021? Maybe it's not the sociopaths anymore. Yeah, I, you know what? I, I still hope, I have hope that it, it's kind of what we observed in that shock jock world with Howard Stern, right? Yeah. Watch Howard Stern now. It's the nicest show in the world. You know, is he like so it, nice? It, I haven't watched him forever. Oh, it's fabulous. Like, okay. it's, uh, you know, really, I mean, nobody's afraid of coming on. You know, he's, he, and he's talked about, it, but, you know, the, the, and I don't know what happened. Maybe the culture is ready for it, but it kind of went in and went out. Um, yeah. And, you know, it, it was, you know, you couldn't help listening, you know, you know, to such raunchy, such unbelievable stuff. Um, but then maybe, I don't know what happened. I don't know what the dynamic was. It's not there anymore. Didn't he go to prison? Howard Stern? No, definitely not. No? No. I thought like, he did. He's out of no. wrong. Okay. No, no. He's, uh, he's, wrong he's just making a ton of money on uh, Sirius XM. It's kind of like yeah. the Joe Rogan. He was like, before Joe Rogan did his thing, 
yeah. on uh, Spotify, right? He signed with Sirius XM to be the anchor. Yeah, I love that. both of them. Though I haven't looked to listened to Howard Stern in quite some time. Yeah, me, me neither. I'm actually finding him on YouTube. <laughs> uh, this is how Somehow goes. they served it up, and it was like, oh, whoa. You got um, the real rec a real recommendation there. So it does work. Yeah. Anyways, Brian, that was awesome. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Uh, we My went pleasure. from your startup to Facebook and the Senate. We, I think we covered everything. No, it was great. I think it was a nice arc of the story. Yeah, same here. Same here. Hope we get to do this again. Thank you so much, Jorson. It was great spending time with you. Talk soon. Take it easy. All right, cheers. Bye. Bye, Brian. Take it easy.